Uh, welcome to Real Vision. My name is Santiago Velez, and today I'm here with the co-founder and CEO of Elrond, which is an exciting project that we hope to showcase uh, and learn more about. Uh, welcome, Bienamin, Mintu. Uh, welcome to Real Vision. Santiago, really great to, to connect and have this conversation. Thanks for having me. All right. So uh, full transparency, you know, I've, I've been in the blockchain space for uh, a while as an observer, investor. I've done many interviews, but I had never heard of the project until fairly recently. And there's been an incredible amount of buzz uh, around it. And I think it's been driven largely by a, a really powerful community. So first of all, let's, let's find out a little bit about yourself and how you got into this. And then we'll get into the project uh, and what you guys are trying to do. So tell us about uh, where you come from. Definitely. Uh, so the the idea is that I've been in the blockchain space since uh, probably 2013, when I initially stumbled into Bitcoin, went deep down the rabbit hole, and um, had this um, fundamental insight that this space was going to um, essentially take over the, the economy. Um, and at that point, um, I, I was looking at two things, specifically the, the new things that um, Bitcoin was going to enable. Um, and then I, I was also trying to take a very careful look at um, uh, some of the uh, potential limitations of Bitcoin, because immediately as, as things uh, were, were becoming clear to me, it was also clear that, that there were some um, limitations there. And so in 2014, I became part of the NEM core team. Um, and then in 2016, together with my brother, we essentially formed a fund through which we invested in something like more than 30 um, architecture blockchain startups. Um, and throughout this process, we, we uh, um, had a really deep understanding of both the fundamental issues, um, the uh, attempted solutions, and then um, all the progress that was being made or not being made. Um, and, and so at the end of 2017, um, after, after investing in, in all this exciting um, and interesting startups, which none of them would, uh, would essentially deliver the, the solution that we were looking for, it was clear that we were still in a space where um, there were two fundamental problems. One of them was um, we got sort of stuck in a dial-up version of the blockchain space. And the second one was that um, UX was so terrible that uh, people had to learn rocket science to basically be able to do um, a few transactions. And so this was the point at which uh, we essentially um, gathered a, a team of uh, really, really resourceful engineers from some of the top um, companies, tech companies in the world with PhDs in computer science and, and so forth, Olympiads in, in math and other technical fields. And uh, we started from the point of gathering a team with which we can literally build rockets uh, because then in essence, any problem we would attempt to solve would not be as difficult as solving uh, this kind of very, very uh, rocket science taking up problems. Um, Elrond started from this point with the goal of building an architecture that could bring a 1000x improvement in throughput execution speed and transaction. What we're showing you here on our YouTube channel is just the tip of the iceberg. No matter where you are in your financial journey, whether you're a beginner just looking to break into the market or a financial professional looking to up your game, Real Vision has something for everyone. Every day our team of expert journalists provides in-depth analysis, written reports, access to live streams, and access to our community, The Exchange, where you can interact with people just like you from all over the world. For just $1, you can unlock all of this and more at realvision.com. Try our essential tier. If you like what you see, it's only 20 bucks a month thereafter. So click on the link in the description, go to realvision.com and see what you think. We look forward to seeing you there. With the goal of building an architecture that could bring a 1000x improvement in throughput, execution speed and transaction cost uh, because we believe that in order for blockchain to really see 
widespread adoption, we would require a transition from dial-up to broadband in the blockchain space. Um, and so um, this is how it all started. Um, we basically had two important breakthroughs um, that Elrond was, was built on. The one, the first one was this idea of adaptive state sharding, uh, where instead of um, processing transaction in a serial manner by all computers at the same time, you basically divide and conquer. So split the network into smaller network, uh, networks, parallelize transaction processing. And the key point is that uh, you can basically have a network that increases with the demand that it requires. So uh, this was one of the elements. And then the second element was if you can scale transaction processing, you also need a very, very efficient, um, effective and secure consensus mechanism. And this is uh, how we came up with secure proof of stake. Um, from, from that point, there's an entire discussion to, to where we came and, and so forth. But the most important thing is that um, Elrond is live, um, open source can process much more than we initially um, set out to. And um, yeah, happy to dive into the, the process, how we came here and uh, where we are at this point. Excellent. So if I'm understanding correctly, you, Elrond tries to solve the central problem of kind of the layer one, uh, generation one blockchains, right? Essentially this trade-off between security, decentralization and scalability. Right, and you're always having to trade one of those for the other. Uh, and so what you're saying is that you put some very talented people to try and solve the problem uh, and scale without compromising, so I guess, some of the core values. Is that a fair summation? Um, yeah, so the I think the blockchain trilemma uh, is basically uh, an assumption that was made at the time where the discussion uh, had some clear limitation on the technical uh, engineering front, but is not necessarily a real uh, fundamental, uh, let's say, constraint. So the trilemma is just uh, an assumption that uh, people at that point coined because they had no better alternative or better solution space uh, in, in mind. Uh, but at this point, I don't think that the trilemma applies uh, in, in the sense that you can have um, both high speed and bandwidth, um, real security uh, and decentralization in a way that was not possible in 2014 when this um, trilemma was initially introduced. And I, I believe Elrond creates a new solution space to imagine things, right? When, when it's like uh, you're trying to look at things in, in a two-dimensional space, then you have some clear constraint. When you're looking at them from three dimensions and, and so on, uh, you have a different kind of uh, solution space. And um, this is where we are at uh, this point. All right, so let's let's take each of these two kind of uh, solution subsets independently. We discuss each. So first, let's get into the sharding. Um, that's a term that I, I've heard originally used and applied to Ethereum in their uh, Ethereum 2.0. Um, how? So you you touched upon it briefly, but can you get it, describe a little bit more what sharding is, how it solves uh, this this problem, and maybe kind of one of the some of the weaknesses maybe, and and how you you address those weaknesses. So. Can you, can you get into that a little bit? Sure, sure. So maybe uh, it would be uh, really good to touch upon the, the technical contributions uh, that we're trying to bring, as you um, suggest, and then also discuss about uh, a new layer where we're trying to address UX with, with a vertically integrated application called MyR. But this may be in, in the uh, second step. Um, coming to your question, uh, the idea with sharding was this. Uh, when you're thinking about solving scalability, the, the key point is um, you have blockchain. Blockchain enables this kind of um, peer-to-peer decentralized transfer of value between any trust, any, any uh, party uh, without the need for a trusted third party. Uh, but 
with block with Bitcoin and then Ethereum, we could only process something like seven transactions per second and then uh, around 15 transactions per second. So the natural question was, how can we scale this up and scale it significantly so that we don't have to discuss about the performance problem? Um, and for us, it was very, very important to zoom out and understand that this was the conversation that um, initially emerged in the early internet days where we had dial-up um, and on top of dial-up uh, connection speeds, uh, you could only build so much. The, the, the lim there was some clear limitations on anything that you could think of and then making that business idea um, have, have a use case that was um, not killing the business uh, where the economics ma made sense. So it seems to me that generally we're at the point where there are a lot of exciting ideas, but without this transition from dial-up to broadband, uh, you will not be able to see this um, spectrum of ideas really take hold at a global level. Um, now, there have been some sort of um, directions to addressing the scalability um, issues. Um, incremental solutions, um, that were just sort of horizontal stay, uh, uh, scaling and then vertical scaling. Um, the, the idea was that most of the solution that uh, that came were just maybe two times better, three times better, and, and so forth. But what we um, saw from the beginning is that if you, from seven transactions per second, move to 15, or for from 15 to 30, you essentially have the same problem, just three months or six months down the road again. So the question was, what would be a sufficiently high bandwidth that would enable us to focus on building the solutions and not to have the discussions regarding the limitations anymore? Uh, because if we can reach this point, at that point, things would change significantly. Businesses would be able to adopt things. The the uh, startup ideas or uh, application ideas could be really built and, and so forth. So um, there have been um, improvements uh, tried where particular nodes, so you have the same network, the same network in which all the nodes process all the workload, at the same time um, in, in a kind of serialized manner. Um, and this um, has been an improvement where uh, within such a network topology, you basically try to improve the hardware of the nodes so that you can process uh, things faster, but you essentially still process them uh, with the entire network, the whole workload uh, in a serialized manner. Um, and this is a kind of constraint that does not allow you to improve significantly. Of course, you can improve uh, like a few times, two, three, five times, but then there's a clear limitation there. Um, and, and the other approach was to think how you can, as a network, split the workload to several networks within the larger network and process workload in a localized manner. So within one network, you have four smaller networks. And by having four smaller networks, you can process four times, five times per load that you would otherwise. Now, of course, um, this is what essentially sharding means. Um, you, you basically split the network, as I said, and then um, process uh, the workload in a parallelized manner. The question then becomes, how can you maintain security how can you maintain efficiency in this type of setting? Um, and for this, we basically put a lot of thought into creating a structure that relies on random sampling of the consensus group so that from the outset, uh, when a node comes within the network, um, joins the network, the node is randomly put in one of the shards that are available. Um, and within that shard, um, there are uh, 500 nodes that are eligible to be part of a consensus group. And then within that 500 nodes group, we have a 61 group that's uh, basically proposing and validating a block every six seconds now. 
Now, this idea uh, means that for every six seconds, you have out of the 500 uh, eligible nodes group, a group that is randomly selected um, that you cannot foretell who will be in the, this consensus group. And then as soon as they're selected, you don't have enough time to essentially attack this group in a decisive way. And then as soon as this block is proposed, a randomly reshuffled group of uh, consensus is again formed and so forth. And to increase this level of security, we've then um, at the end of each epoch, which now um, is defined basically as 24 hours, um, you, you basically have one third of nodes in each shard being reshuffled to other shards so as to increase the level of security even more. Um, uh, I'm, I'm curious how, how much this makes sense and if, uh, if you want to clarify more on this front or um, also a bit more on the um, secure proof of stake consensus element. Yeah, so I mean, I guess uh, stepping back for a second, I would say that what I'm observing is that there's kind of been two significant conceptual realizations for your project. The first is that you needed to have a layer one uh, blockchain system that was sufficiently, had enough performance that business logic could be abstracted onto it uh, without compromise, right? Because, uh, you know, it would be kind of like trying to build Netflix on top of dial-up back in the 90s. It, it wouldn't have worked. That kind of business model just wouldn't have worked. So I guess you reason that you, you had to solve the layer one problem first, um, and then then you could have all the, all the throughput that you would want to build the businesses on. And then the second conceptual kind of push was, all right, how do you horizontally scale uh, while not compromising on security uh, using this, the sharding methodology uh, and then still be able to achieve consensus. And I think that was giving up this concept that all nodes everywhere have to know everything at all times, right? So this idea that shared state as a consensus um, has to be 100% overlap um, for everything. And I think that uh, we're seeing a lot of projects come to that realization that you can have uh, kind of these segmented shared states, these little micro universes of, of consensus. Um, and then I assume that you must have some kind of overarching uh, uh, batch resolution method, right? You, you have all these sharded states that you have to then reconcile at the end of the day between each other, right? To create the overall network, is, is that true? Yes, yes. And that's called the meta chain. There's a meta chain that communicates all the shards then um, the, the idea is that as long as you have a very clear version of the meta chain uh, where everything is in sync, you basically have uh, both the, the throughput um, and then also the uh, uh, sync within the entire network so that uh, um, everything can move forward one block at a time, uh, but in a way that doesn't compromise anything and then has this unbreakable uh, security and history. Yeah, that makes sense. And I guess that's, uh, you know, a way you can solve the double spend problem and make sure that at the end of the day, these transactions are reliable and secure, but also scalable. So it's almost kind of an inversion of layer two and layer one as you, you've kind of inverted them uh, and realized the benefits. So why don't we get into what the project um, has achieved so far? You said you're live at the beginning of our conversation. So what does live mean to you and, and what can developers and users start doing on it? Um, yeah, so the, the goal of Elrond, uh, which I think is very, very important to underscore, is that we're trying to build the back backbone for a high bandwidth, low latency, transparent financial system. And then secondly, give access to this system to anyone, anywhere. And why we're doing this is that we believe that fundamentally the current economic system is broken in a way that cannot be solved from the inside. Both uh, opaqueness, uh, misaligned incentives, and low bandwidth of the current economic system um, are, are very, very problematic. But then second, um, there are still 1.7 billion people that don't have access to basic financial infrastructure. So we believe that if we can bring a system like this live um, and 
uh, offer it to the world, we could bring perhaps the largest GDP, global GDP multiplier since the invention of the internet. Um, and now coming to, to where we are, this, this is the goal. Uh, the question is, um, where did we start from and what, what did we achieve in the meantime? So I'd like to shift the conversation over to, uh, you know, what, what problem do you think this is going to solve? Uh, how are you going to incentivize uh, new businesses to join on or users? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, what, what, is, what have you achieved so far? You know, you mentioned earlier in the, in the um, video uh, that we, you've gone live. So what does this mean exactly? Sure, sure. Uh, so, again, just just uh, uh, putting this in context, um, Elrond is built with the uh, goal of uh, creating a high bandwidth, low latency, transparent financial system, and then extend access to this financial system to anyone, anywhere. And uh, we believe this is fundamentally important, especially today, because on the one hand, the current economy is very low bandwidth. Um, you, you still have um, very low bandwidth and high latency. So you still have to wait for overnight transfers, weekends uh, are closed and, and so forth. A lot of inefficiency there. There are um, broken um, pieces of the system that cannot be solved from the inside. The system is still very much opaque and, and so forth. And having an alternative to this, a complementary alternative, would of course uh, enable us to work much faster at a higher scale for the entire global economy. And then second of all, there are still 1.7 billion people that are not connected to the current financial system, don't have any kind of basic financial infrastructure. And giving them a chance to participate would increase the entire pie significantly uh, for the for the entire world, um, and we're trying to do these two things in in two ways. The first one is done via the Elrond network, which is this new layer one blockchain, uh, which addresses the fundamental problems that we've discussed about from first principles. So, trying to find a solution that is sufficiently high bandwidth and low latency to enable businesses from all over the world to start building um, on the blockchain layer without having to worry about economics not making sense, performance not making sense, and just be able to ship the applications they really care about. And then the second element is, of course, a user interface that enables us um, to um, give access to anyone in the world with a simple mobile application to the coolest blockchain features. This is called Myar. Um, this has been launched only two months uh, from, I think, the 30th of January. Uh, but the, the excitement that we've seen uh, and the progress adoption we've seen are tremendous. So let me get back uh, on, on each of these points. Um, the Elrond network from where we set out to uh, is now been, um, has been launched since um, 30th of July last year. Uh, what, does mean, what does it mean that it has been launched? So we have a fully state sharded architecture with now more than 3,200 nodes distributed all over the world. Uh, and this now is probably one of the largest proof of stake uh, networks uh, in, in production. Uh, second, we can process upwards of 15,000 transactions per second right now with a 0 0.001 cent transaction cost. But this can scale to hundreds of thousands of transactions because remember, uh, with the state sharding element, we can just need we we just need to add a few more shards to scale beyond 100,000 uh, transactions. We have actually done some demonstration of the network doing 200 upwards of 250,000 transactions per second. Uh, and at this point, we don't see necessarily the demand. So what we want to do is focus on bringing in the demand. 
um, showing that there's a real use case that businesses really want to use this and then scale up beyond 100,000 uh, transactions if needed. Uh, now, beyond the network being live, beyond it uh, being to uh, be able to process more than uh, 15,000 transactions per second and having more than 3,200 nodes, um, it's important to note that we're at the point where more than 63% of the network, uh, of the circulating supply is staked. So a lot of demand on that front and, and growing significantly. Um, second, we basically came to a point where in January, as I said, we um, launched this new application called Myar, which, uh, which purpose uh, was to uh, simplify the blockchain experience, enable anyone to send money to anyone to a username or a hero tag, and then do so in a way that they don't have to learn everything regarding private public keys and, and so forth. So what has happened is that in four days since the launch of Myar, we basically doubled the number of addresses on the network doubled the number of transactions processed in six months. We had a number like something like 1 million transactions processed. And then in four days, we crossed 2 million. Um, and at this point, we're at something like um, 340,000 users within the Myar application in just two months. So the growth has been tremendous. Uh, we're at probably something like almost 4.5 million transactions processed within the network uh, and mm, something like 550,000 addresses uh, within the network. Things are growing very, very um, significantly and uh, we're, we're just preparing for the next phase of growth where uh, the smart contracts are live within Elrond so people can build um, a lot of cool things with a, uh, a Rust framework that mm -hmm. is available to, to developers. We have a Mandos testing framework that enables developers to then, uh, as they deploy a smart contract or before they deploy a smart contract to test things in real time, see where the bugs are and, and so forth. We have um, um, a kind of Wasm VM on which this Rust framework is built. And then everything um, is integrated in a, in a, a basic VS code layer that enables um, developers to interact with the SDK, with the Rust framework, with the Mandos testing framework um, in a very, very simple manner uh, so that they can go through the uh, development process as fast as possible. Um, now, the most exciting things within the network are um, the um, DeFi module that's coming live within this scalable network. So within the DeFi module, we have a Myer exchange, which is this um, automated market maker built on Elrond to leverage the performance of the architecture and enable streamlined liquidity for the entire network. A lot of projects that, that are coming live and uh, have been preparing to um, come live um, are, are now speeding up things. Um, and the Myer exchange will have its own tokens uh, token uh, uh, the max token the max token will be basically available it's fully community based um, not owned by any um, team and and so forth it's just shared with the e-gold holders uh, which which uh, um, have have e-gold are staking e-gold have some of them in myr and and so forth so once the exchange comes live, the second element is um, the Myer Launchpad, which is this very, very important platform where we select some of the coolest startups in the world that are trying to take blockchain technology beyond blockchain as an ecosystem. So they are implementing blockchain in some fields with high impact. Uh, in a way that's very, very meaningful. We have a lot of startups that are applying already 
and during the next one or two weeks we'll announce the first uh, really exciting startup that is coming live on the Elrond Launchpad. Then beyond this, the uh, Myar lending platform uh, is also coming live. Uh, again, the, the idea is that since we have this scalable network and we have this very simple user interface, of course, that on top of them, you want to offer everything related to um, money, like crypto money, but also stable uh, coins that exist. And then on top of that, you will have uh, basically any type of exchanges being um, enabled, any type of lending being, being enabled, then synthetic assets, and then bridges to all the main architectures and, and blockchains in, in the space. Um, NFTs are also coming live in Myar in, in the next uh, one or two months uh, in May. We are, we are basically prioritizing this uh, very, very much. And um, beyond this, what, what I would basically underscore is that we see this as perhaps the most important generational opportunity in the technology space since the invention of the internet. And uh, the, the key thing is that we're not seeing it as a zero sum game. So it's this is not a game of Elrond being the Ethereum killer or Elrond being the Bitcoin killer and so forth. This is just a, a zero sum, sum framing. But when you understand things correctly, you understand that we basically have something like 100 million people within the space at this point, and we could have billions of people that could really use this um, services, this new economy, um, and do it in a way that's really compelling. So if we enable the next billion people to join, it's not only Elrond that will win, but the Bitcoin, um, Ethereum, the exchanges, and all the, the really compelling platforms that exist, um, and it's this that's the one thing that's super, super exciting for us. And this is why we're taking this very different approach of not only creating the technical architecture, but combining it with the simplicity of a mobile application to really enable the next billion people to join. Wow, that's fantastic! That's an excellent vision. Uh, let's let's unpack a little bit of a, of that uh, because I heard a lot of themes that um, resonate with me, and and um, I'm also curious about a few things. So, uh, the you mentioned the e gold. I assume e g l d is a symbol regarding the native um, digital asset or token of 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 the Elrond platform. Is is that correct? Yes. Yes. E gold so, um, is is this maybe. Just simplifying things, uh, eGold is this idea that we've had uh, books and then eBooks. Uh, we've had uh, uh, basically mail and email, and then we've had gold and eGold. Um, this is the idea that will will scale and uh, through which we convey uh, things very very simply. Okay, so so you have the you have the native token, and I assume that in the uh, proof of stake system. The node validators um, stake a certain amount of their uh, of the e gold, which I assume is is has a finite supply, um, and, and then as part of the stake, it augments the security model, uh, and then that can process transactions. Does the e gold uh, have some kind of yield for the validators for processing those transactions, um, or and how does that work exactly? So indeed. Eagold has a fixed supply. At this point, the fixed supply is equal to pi. So there's uh, three one uh, about approximately thirty one million uh, that will ever be possible to exist. But this supply basically uh, decreases with each passing day in a way where. Um, of course, the network puts in an incentive for the security and transaction processing of the entire network. And this incentive is that it is basically paid either via the, this new emission uh, from the current supply to the potential maximum supply. Um, at this point, we're at something like 17.5 million, and that's the total maximum uh, to which it will go uh, for, for the uh, validators. But 
there's a very interesting approach here where if we have enough adoption, the supply becomes fixed and no new emission comes into circulation because there's a specific incentive defined for the validators for each of the one to 10 years. And then if the amount of rewards that's coming from adoption, so for, from real transactions being processed within the network is higher than the defined uh, reward for the validators, at that point, no new emission comes into circulation. So this is a very, very elegant approach of having the bootstrapping done, having a lot of security, a lot of transaction processing. But if the adoption picks up and is basically beyond 10.87% uh, during the first year, then 9.78% during the second year, and so forth, um, at that point, no new emission comes into circulation. and Elrond or Eagle becomes a lot scarcer uh, with each new adoption cycle king, kicking in. So, so again, this is, seems to be a very interesting inversion of the balance between new emissions, as you call it, or in Bitcoin stock to flow uh, versus the, exactly. the, the fees that the proof of work miners um, collect to process the transactions. This is kind of an inversion of that and saying, as the network scales up, uh, to, so that you don't have this kind of deluge of supply of the token, you'll you'll effectively throttle down on the normal emission schedule, the the, the, the embedded stock to flow, and uh, rely more on the fee schedule in, in in such a point that eventually you don't need any emissions at all, right? That you don't need this kind of um, just uh, monetary policy that in, that is deflationary. So, at the end of the day, you, you're going to you're going to yield kind of a, a, a equilibrium. It seems in the system that are based primarily on transactions and basically the utility use of it, rather than just um, waiting for tokens to, to to be you know instantiated. So that seems very 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 clever. Very clever. I commend you on that. That's excellent. Uh, I, I and I think this is the best of both worlds. So there is a fixed maximum supply, of course, but that fixed maximum supply decreases each day where you have real adoption, which is the coolest thing possible because it means you have a potential stock to flow for each of the years, but then the revised stock to flow can mean that in three years you reach maximum because if adoption is basically uh, bringing beyond 10% rewards for the validator, then from that point, you have no new emission. Uh, for, and this doesn't mean that it will happen in year five or year three, but it means that this is a kind of challenge. If you can bring adoption during year one to exceed that type of reward threshold, then uh, starting with year one, you'll be in a different kind of scenario. And it's also the first one of the first compelling models where you have both Bitcoin's scarcity and a model to bootstrap uh, until you reach a kind of adoption where the entire incentive relies upon fees and not inflation, right? Yeah, no, and that's that's super exciting because that's one of the things that um, either either in Bitcoin or Ethereum, nobody really anticipates what it will look like when it's entirely fee based, right? And you're, what you're proposing is basically you're accelerating the monetary policy um, many years, right? You're, you're not waiting until that that final supply is complete. Um, you're going to let the market determine that, uh, and it, it will just be variable with respect to the demand of the network itself. So I think that's very, very interesting. I'm, I'm excited to see how it turns out. Um, so I'd like to switch gears a little bit and, and talk about... Um, you know how how Elron integrates with maybe other blockchains. Is is there any aspect of interoperability? Because you, earlier you talked about several layers that you foresee build, building on top of it, exchanges or automated market makers. Um, is there any idea of uh, of uh, interoperability? And I guess one other question is: uh, Is the Ethereum virtual machine also implemented? So is it make is it easy to port uh, smart contracts and other features from you know Ethereum or other chains? Sure. So the the idea. I believe is that the further down you look, uh, the clearer it becomes that without interoperability, this will be just segregated islands, 
Um, it doesn't matter how much scalability you have. Of, of course, at first, this matters a lot because you gather a kind of critical mass of adoption of businesses, partners, and, and so forth. And um, we have more than 150 partners that are part of the Elrond network are building, contributing, and so forth to the Elrond ecosystem at this point. Um, but it's extremely important that you enable a streamlined flow uh, between all the main blockchains that exist out there so that value can flow from each one to each one and leverage some of these uh, interesting properties that we discovered within different blockchains. So what we're doing specifically to address this is uh, twofold. We have a layer of bridges that are coming live and um, we already have one that integrates uh, or creates interoperability between Elrond and Bitcoin, Elrond and Ethereum, Elrond and Binance uh, and Binance Smart Chain, um, Elrond and Ontology, and then some other um, uh, blockchains that are currently in the process. But this is already covering more than 80% of like more significantly more than 80% of the, the network. And then uh, we're going to take this um, one step at a time in validating some of the key blockchains that we discover uh, with which we see synergies and complementary approaches and adding each of them so that as we enable new exchanges, lending platforms and so forth, this DeFi element will ideally first become very scalable and very user friendly and then it will become um, cross-chain, right? Uh, just interoperable with, with other ecosystems. And uh, we're quite excited about this phase and believe that at some point, this will be super common sense, right? Well, we're, we're not even talking anything um, wild here. It's uh, super, super basic. I 100% agree. I, I think that's how the Internet of Value is going to form is through cross-chain interoperability. And, you know, every so far up to this point, every blockchain has had to worry about how it's going to bring liquidity into the ecosystem and then survive on its own, right, as kind of this isolated ecosystem. And what you're suggesting is if you abstract these layers to build business logic on uh, and, and then build these bridges to other chains, then they can essentially share in each other's liquidity. They can draw on liquidity from other chains and then build um, financial instruments that actually are, are, are useful and that the user then is kind of agnostic to the underlying technology. What they care about is solving a specific problem in their daily life. They don't care about which chain necessarily they might be using. Um, so, so I absolutely agree that aligns with, with the vision I see for how these, these, this is going to turn out rather than you know a few isolated islands, which is kind of the way the internet started, we're gonna have this um, you know network of networks and the interoperability. So I, I think you're spot on there. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about maybe um, you know the next six months where you, where you see Elron um, building this future and what, what maybe if you can give us a sneak peek of some of the more exciting applications that you see being built on Elron. Um, sure, the, the idea, as I said, is if we zoom out again and look at the early internet days, there have been two specific critical moments that have changed the trajectory of the early internet days. Uh, the first one was the browser, uh, which simplified things to such a degree that anyone could just come in and click on some websites. And then in effect, it created a market to be addressed. And then the second one was this transition from dial-up to broadband. And this enabled businesses to really build something that makes sense, not only um, sounds interesting, but then makes sense from a, a business and economic standpoint. Um, and I believe we're at that particular point in time where we finally have both the performance really needed to bring uh, some more exciting applications in, within the blockchain space, and then we also have the simplicity needed via an application like, like Myar to really onboard um, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, and then billions of people. Uh, and within this space, then you can see how things will um, accelerate to a point where I, I believe the most exciting thing 
for the next period will be probably the point at which one of these uh, blockchain networks exceeds the value of a lot of countries. And then people basically resonate much more with a digital cloud country, let's say, uh, than a, a real country in the world in a complementary manner, of course. And what Elrond uh, tries to do on this front is one, um, of course, the main focus is um, in building Myar and bringing a lot of users in, enabling them to, as I said, exchange value because in, the, in, in Myar we have a distributed name service that enable usernames instead of private public keys, but integrates them already with several blockchains. So you can not only send eGold to friends via a username, but you can also send Ethereum, you can also send Binance, and probably this week or the next, Bitcoin as well. So this already brings you in a different world where you're playing and then you discover that you can really do this type of global transfer at trivial cost uh, with, with almost instant speeds. But then moving further down the road, the most exciting elements uh, we see is the Meyer exchange that uh, we've already announced and is uh, based on this uh, advanced automated market maker that is coming live in the next few weeks. Um, it's, it's super exciting to be able to have in-network built-in liquidity within the Elrond ecosystem and see how this takes off. But um, I, I would expect this to be one of the most significant advances beyond um, the network being live uh, and Meyer being live, because at this point, you're going to become economically significant. Um, you have the full circle of projects, not only announcing that they come, not only building stuff, but then also releasing the, their tokens, having um, the utility within their ecosystem. And um, to do this, of course, we have the Alron standard digital token, which is an, a kind of improved version of ERC-20 um, that people can rely on and that has native Elrond speed without the need for smart contracts. So mm -hmm. it simplifies um, interaction so that projects can build it very fast enable uh, things and then when you have the Meyer exchange you have the ESDT version integrated within the Meyer exchange so you have liquidity immediately and this I believe will accelerate the entire economy uh, within the Elrond ecosystem beyond this of course there's the Meyer launchpad um, as I said where we'll see a lot of other vertical um, integrated use cases with super compelling startups where it's not about quantity, but really qualitative teams that are hardcore and pushing for, for um, this level. And they'll be able to raise funds. They'll be able to get the support of the Elron community um, and, and so forth. And we're very excited because the people within the community, of course, are um, very much looking forward to participate in other projects, to support them, to go through this entire exciting um, uh, and adventurous process uh, that, that we're putting forward. Then the lending platform and NFTs, um, I, I believe, will be super powerful. Um, and, and just adding one touch on that front, uh, I think to sum up, the impact of NFTs will be to artists very much as tech startups have, have been to technical people. So we'll see the next generation of artists just dropping out of school um, and, and then focusing on building communities and building these new ideas, bringing them to life um, within their communities. And NFTs will be the key element enabling that. We just need a way to express NFTs without the noise, right? Because the difficult thing is not in adding 1,000 element and creating this um, whole noise uh, wave that we are seeing right now, but in taking some, some things away, add a, adding um, a kind of productive constraint, a uh, filtering mechanism so as to see what's valuable and what's not. Where, where's, where's the signal and where's the noise? And this is what we are um, 
super excited about because it will come in Meyer, uh, where it's uh, at first invited only um, with some really top artists from around the world and then gradually rolling out to a larger community but in a way where you you feel that there's something special out there and you're not just throwing your nft in the trash bin yeah well that I mean that makes sense in terms of curation right i mean netflix for example they curate exactly the type of content that they think their users may want but then they they start getting intelligent about you know, taking the feedback of prior views and, you know, recommendation engines and using machine learning to say, hey, here's the next thing you might want to watch. I think in the NFT space, to your point, there is a significant amount of noise and we're going to need better algorithms, better curation methods to kind of distill the the, the, the good art from the bad or, or, you know, the useless tokens. So I absolutely agree. I think there's so much opportunity to build on all these infrastructures, uh, but the but to your point, the fundamentals have to be strong. You have to have high throughput, scalability, security on layer one to make sure you can really build these um, business abstractions to the level that, that we need them, right? At a global scale. So I, I, I absolutely agree. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited to see uh, how this progresses. I hope that um, we'll have you back on Real Vision to discuss in detail as these things come out and we can look backwards and, and say, uh, whether they were successful or not. I, we, we learned from our failures too, I think. So um, would, can we get you to commit now to come back and share with us uh, what's what, 100%. what the status? Excellent. 100%. No, uh, I, I think the next, as I said before, the next period, I, I'll even uh, go so far to say that during this year, we'll probably see the first nation states. So uh, hmm. either nations, states, and, and a really large institution adopting things to a point where you feel like the tipping point has reached, has been reached, and then a, a new wave is coming. And we're specifically working with Elrond to create and accelerate this type of wave. Because if we can bring this, then the entire space, like uh, the entire discussion will shift uh, a few a few years ahead, and um, yeah, I, we're we're definitely open to to having the conversations and coming back with with more updates and um, exciting news as as things unfold. That's fantastic, excellent. I, I appreciate you coming on, and and we we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Santiago. Really great to have this discussion.